Welcome back to the Law Father Podcast. As always, we are here in Law Father headquarters. Uh, and as always, check us out on our social media, Instagram, Facebook, a little bit on TikTok. And special thank you to Radio Influence and Jason for always sh- showing up early on Monday mornings and getting the show all put together. And I believe last week I had mentioned that uh, DJ Eakin and I, who is also on Radio Influence. It, we're going to uh, talk about Dr. Dre and his divorce. Uh, that got pushed to this week. So those of you who are looking out for that, that listen to this show, take a look for it later this week. Uh, it is August 2nd. So uh, first week in August. Look for that. Uh, I believe we're going to do it this Friday. So uh, there was somebody who called out sick. So unfortunately, we couldn't run the show on that uh, because... Everybody wanted everybody involved uh, in that conversation. So should be a good conversation there. But let's look at a couple of kind of quick hit topics, and then let's get into some listener questions for today. We'll hit a couple of listener questions uh, in addition to some of these quick hit topics. And uh, look out next week for uh, a show on White Boy Rick. He was a a teenage drug dealer out of Detroit. And uh, we'll dive a whole lot deeper into that. There's a lawsuit going on, so which brings a little bit of relevance to it and kind of ripe for the picking on this show. So first off, what I want to touch on is let's go back to the election. Okay. And uh, by the election, I'm talking about the presidential election. And I I don't think unless you were living under a rock over the past, uh, I don't know, uh, eight, nine months that you kind of have a clue of that there was some allegations that the election was fraudulent and uh, there was miscounting and things of that nature. Well, In Texas, the attorney general filed a lawsuit on that and to the point that saying that the election was fraudulent, that there were issues uh, with the election. Okay. Now, the attorney general is an elected position. Okay. So essentially, an attorney general is a politician. Okay. Uh, And uh, in this case, the attorney general is an attorney. Okay. And this is a case out of Texas. Well, Here's the deal. There is a Democrat group, the Lawyers Defending American Democracy, who took issue with the state attorney general filing this lawsuit. And like I said, the lawsuit has to do with the the election and whether it was fraudulent. And we're not going to get into the merits of whether or not the election was fraudulent because that's not the point of this story. The point of this story is that we have an elected official who files a lawsuit Okay, presumably, all right, we're going to assume for the sake of argument that because he's an elected official, that he's doing it on behalf of his constituents, on behalf of the people who vote for him. Okay, so when we look at it from this perspective, the Defending American Democracy Group has filed an ethics complaint with the state bar against the attorney general, saying that the lawsuit was frivolous. Now, my point of bringing this up is this. The attorney general is an elected position, as I mentioned. And that elected official is representing right, wrong, or indifferent, okay? Doing what they feel is best for their constituents. Doing what they feel is best for the people who voted for him, okay? So why then should something like that be subject to an ethics complaint. Okay. Now look, I I am not saying that lawyers should not be held to high ethical standards. And I am not saying that other lawyers shouldn't police other lawyers, because at least that's how it is here in Florida. Okay. We have a duty and an obligation to police our own profession. Okay. Yes, the the public can do it as well. uh, But for certain violations, we actually have a duty and an obligation to report. And if we don't, then we're in as much trouble. I shouldn't say as much trouble, but we can get in trouble uh, just like the person who uh, actually did uh, the wrongdoing, okay? But should it be different for an elected official? And I would argue, yes, it should, because the reality is an elected official should have a little bit more freedom to make some moves based on what that person feels like the people who voted for him want or, or him or her want them to do. And in this case, it is, uh, it is a male. His name is uh, Ken Paxton. Okay. He is the Texas attorney general. So should Ken be allowed to open things up a little bit and, 
or should he be subject to as much scrutiny? And I would argue that as an elected official, you're always under scrutiny. You're always under more intense scrutiny. And guess what? If the public doesn't like what you're doing, they're just not going to vote for you the next time the election comes up. So point being, should elected officials, even when they are lawyers, be subject to the same ethical requirements as lawyers who are not politicians? For the most part, yes. But I would argue if it's in the in the carrying out of their duties of their office, okay, probably not, right? And, and I'm not talking Nixon style, right? Look, there's clearly wrong, right? And something along the lines of Watergate and Nixon, clearly wrong, right? Whether or not a lawsuit is filed uh, on behalf of fraud or fraud, is that clearly wrong? Probably not. Is it what a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people, and a lot of politicians felt that the Republican voting base wanted? Yeah, probably. And I would say there was a, a certain section of the Republican voting base that wanted that. But at the end of the day, I also feel like there was probably a, a decent part of the Republican voting base that said, "Hey, let's just move on and, and keep it moving." So. Um, that's that. I, I, in my opinion, don't think elected officials should be subjected to the same level of scrutiny when it comes to ethics complaints in the carrying out of their duties, unless they are clearly wrong, like well, Nixon. But you know, in that sense, when you have something that's clearly wrong like that, you're probably going to have other issues other than just the uh, state bar and uh, their powers. You know, I don't know, maybe uh, criminal powers and you know, ending up in jail. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up in jail. I don't look very good in orange. So um, that's that's that uh, piece. Next thing I want to look at is marijuana laws. Okay, and just kind of a, a quick quick piece on this because you could really dedicate a whole show, probably a couple shows, on uh, what marijuana laws are, how they look, the federal system, everything else. Okay, real quick, down and dirty. Here's what it is. Several states, I believe it's uh, in the neighborhood of 36. Yeah, 36 states um, allow marijuana in some form. 18 of those states allow it in recreational form. So here's the deal. Some states have allowed it in the federal system, in not just the federal system, but under federal law, marijuana is still illegal. You actually can still eat. You could be in one of those 36 states and you technically could still be arrested for possession of marijuana. Doesn't matter the reason. You could be completely within the confines of your state laws, okay, and still be arrested for a marijuana. And if you take a look, uh, a lot of the businesses that engage in marijuana, um, in legal engagement in marijuana, that is, have a lot of difficulty with banks because banks are federally regulated, and there's a lot of implications that come along with that. Uh, FDIC, if you've ever heard that, if you've heard a bank say that they're F FDIC insured, um, it, it is a federal insurance, so that way, um, if something were to happen to the bank, that your money is safe and protected. So the U.S. Supreme Court, though, has kind of come out and said, and it's through Justice Clarence Thomas, that, hey, the federal government has to has to get out of their own way, right? They have this half in, half out stance right now, and something has to give. You can't, and for the most part, the federal government has decriminalized marijuana, which means this, it's still illegal, but they're not going to enforce it. And I think a lot of that comes into this half in, half out, right? So what what Justice Thomas is saying, that U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thomas is saying, you have to make a decision. We're either going to keep it illegal and we're going to enforce it and we're going to crack down on the states that have made it legal and we're just going to go back to the way it was or we go, hey, you know what? It's legal. All right. So that's that's how that works. All right. And that's what that's what he's getting. So I would expect to see at some point, definitely in our lifetime, but I would say, you know, more than likely in, I would say in the next few years, right? And that may even be a little bit long that we see a definite change in the federal government and that maybe they make it legal, okay? And go from there. So that is the the pot stance on that. I mean, there's several things that the federal government 
can do. And, and there's several ways that the federal government can regulate it and keep states in line. Uh, one of those, if you just, if you take a step back and not to get off on a tangent on it, but if you look at our alcohol laws, every single state is 21 and up to drink. Yeah, that's not a federal law, okay? What it is, and, and yeah, we, we see this actually in Florida, and I'll touch on this in a second, but the drinking age is 21 because the federal government came through and said, if you want federal funding for your roads, you will raise your drinking age to 21. That's it. That's how we got there, okay? So is it a federal rule? Did, did the feds come in and make a law? Nope. But they sure made it impossible for the states to to do anything with their roads, right? States count on that federal funding. And so to that end, one of the things that I read recently, and look, we're, we're back in this crazy time in the pandemic, right? It's kind of ebb and flow of things. And uh, we're back to, hey, even if you're vaccinated, you should wear masks indoors. Um, look, for, uh, to not, not to politicize it by any stretch of the imagination, I don't understand it. I try to look at things from a common sense perspective and I try to make sense of A A and B, right? But I go, if vaccinations are the key, right? And they're the best source, why are we making vaccinated people wear masks, right? So I I don't know. I'm no scientist. I'm no doctor. I'm just a lowly lawyer here trying to use my common sense brain of saying, hey, if you have a shot, that's the safest way to go, okay? Um, you know, I, I think about it like this and, and this may sound crass. I was on an airplane recently and you know, I had my mask on and on the plane because, well, I don't want to get arrested on a plane. That's not a good look. Uh, I don't believe the bar would appreciate that either, but, uh, you know, somebody was, uh, laying out some farts in front of me and, uh, yeah, I had my mask on and I could still smell it. It was, it was awful. But the point of the point of the matter is if I can still smell that, okay, how much is that actually protecting me from anything else in the air? I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but I look at it and go, I, I don't know. I just don't know. It makes me question, right? That said, if you haven't had the shot, go get it. It seems to be the key. Um, but where we went, yeah, we got off way, way off. Okay. We were talking, let's figure out where we were talking about how we got onto this. We were talking about the federal government and how uh, marijuana and how I, I mentioned that we could potentially see how the federal government could make it legal for uh, f- make marijuana legal and then tie it back into the states by tying some funding into it and, and forcing them to make uh, the laws kind of uniform and maybe set an age limit out on it, things like that, just like they did with alcohol. Well, Florida, Governor DeSantis has actually done something very similar with the mask mandates. That's how we got on that tangent, right? So for schools this year, what what Governor DeSantis has said is that you cannot, as a school, require masks. And if you do, okay, and you get state funding, guess what? Your state funding is gone, all right? So kind of similar to alcohol in the federal government, Governor DeSantis has said, look, hey, state of Florida, schools in the state of Florida that take federal funding, so not your private schools, okay, not your private schools that don't receive any federal fund, or excuse me, any state funding. Uh, Some of them do. Some of them, uh, for example, VPK, they'll take a state voucher, and they'll also have their own private program as well. Um, But for those schools, so public schools, and we'll call them the hybrid type private schools, guess what? If you want your state funding for your school, you can't let your students wear masks or you can't, for, sorry, you can't force your students to wear masks. Okay. There has been nothing that's come out that says that schools have to require students do not wear masks. It, it basically, what it's come down to is it's the parents' choice. Parent chooses for their kid to wear a mask, fine. But if you're a, a state funded school or a school that receives any state funding, you can't, you can't force them to Otherwise, you lose your state funding, okay? So that's that piece of it. Now, I know uh, we we missed a few weeks on some listener questions, so kind of have some in the bank here. So let's let's look at some, okay? And let's take a little bit of a departure on this first one from our normal uh, personal injury type. Let's look at DUI, okay? And this question is this. I got pulled over for DUI. They ran me through the field sobriety tests, and then they asked me to blow in a breathalyzer. 
Should I blow? And that, that's a very loaded question. Okay, it really is. Uh, there's many schools of thought on this, um, but in my opinion, at least, it comes down to simple math. All right. Now let's look at some some pieces on the forefront here. The field sobriety exercises. Those are tough, and what they're actually meant to do is they're meant to test your cognitive, your mental, your thinking part, and your physical, and it forces you to do both of those at the same time, okay? Now, look, having been in law enforcement and having administered those tests, I could tell you they are very difficult tests. Uh, I got Jason sitting here across from me. I'm sure that at 834 on Monday morning, uh, Jason is probably stone cold sober. And uh, I could probably, we could probably step out of the podcast studio here and I could fail him on field sobriety exercises. Okay. I, I would bet probably a paycheck on that, that I absolutely could. Okay. It's just not set up for you to pass. Right. So, you know, it's difficult because that's the first step. That is what gives them their reasonable suspicion to, well, they need, excuse me, reasonable suspicion to administer the test. And then that gives them their probable cause to make the arrest. Okay. So they make the arrest, they take you down and they, they have you blow. Okay. Now here's the thing. Here's what you need to think about. And look, if you're clearly drunk and you know, you're clearly drunk, it is a really easy scenario. You just don't blow because you're never going to be able to do this math in your head. Right? So Think about it like this. On average, for the average person, all right? Now, look, average is average, so you can't necessarily go by this by 100%, okay? And depending on what you're drinking, it depends on the strength of what you're drinking, okay? But a single drink, and so it's one can of beer, one shot of liquor, um, there's a whole calculation on it, and it, it tells you the amount of ounces for the beer, amount of ounces for wine, an amount of ounces for a shot of liquor. Okay. So if you're at a bar and they're pouring heavy pours on your drinks, you have to take that in mind as what well. keep that in mind as well. But point being on average, broad generalization, you metabolize, you get rid of your body processes one drink every hour. Okay. So if you have one drink, you drink it, you wait an hour that drinks out of your system. Theoretically, you should blow triple zeros theoretically. Okay. So that's, that's the sciency part behind it. So if you can do the math and if you can go, okay, I had a drink at eight o'clock, I got stopped at 10 o'clock and here's, here's where you can start to think about it even more. You get stopped. It's going to take you, oh, about 45 minutes from the moment you're stopped till the moment. And that, that may actually even be on the short end, 45 minutes from the moment you're stopped to the moment they bring you down the central breath testing. And then there's a 20 minute observation period. So you have a whole nother hour built in. So you had your last drink at eight o'clock. It's 10 o'clock when you get stopped. Figure it's about 11 o'clock by the time they're asking you to actually blow in the breathalyzer. Okay. That's three hours. Think about it. Three hours before you're actually blowing, you had your last drink. Chances are, okay, now let's assume you had one drink. Let's not go down that path of you had five drinks all at 8 o'clock. You had five shots right at 8 o'clock, okay? That's a terrible math problem, okay? And, and actually, based on that math, you're probably going to blow over. But you have one drink, had it, finished it by 8 o'clock, by 11 o'clock, which is when you're at central breath testing and your observation period has passed, you're most likely going to blow triple zeros, okay? And it's going to make their case very, very hard to prove. Now, if you blow triple zeros, they're going to give you a drug test. Now, assuming you don't use drugs, including marijuana, and, and including prescription drugs, okay? And, and I don't mean the abuse of prescription drugs, okay? But let's say you're prescribed hydrocodone, all right? That you can actually be charged and convicted of DUI for that. But let's assume none of that. All right, they're going to give you the test. They're going to give you a cup. You're going to go to the bathroom. You're going to go take care of that cup. And then it's going to come back and it's going to be clean. It's going to make their DUI case very, very hard. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, there is a simple calculation. So should you blow, should you not blow? Kind of depends on your circumstances. If, if you're not sure, then you probably shouldn't blow. Okay, but if you know, then it's probably okay to blow. All right. So that is what my take is on DUI stops. Let's look at one more listener question for the day. 
All right. And we'll take it back to the car crash side, back to the personal injury side, because I get more questions on that than anything else. And the question is this, the insurance company offered me $500 for my injuries. That's a lot of money. Should I take it? Well, that is a very good question. It's something that comes up a lot. Now, at first glance, actually pretty much any time, I would say, I can't think of a time, okay? I'm sure there is. I'm sure there's a one-off time where I would say, take it. For the most part, don't take it until you talk to an attorney, okay? I could tell you story after story of potential clients that I've talked to who said, hey, uh, I went to the hospital. I had a, I had a fracture. I had something severe for an injury. My car was totaled. Uh, it's been six months since it happened. I'm in a lot of pain, and I don't know what to do. And then as we start talking more and more, I find out, oh, yeah, client potential client took $500 from the insurance company to settle the case, okay? Look, once you do that, it's done. It's over with. It doesn't matter how hurt you are right? It doesn't matter if you lost a limb. It doesn't matter if you have a traumatic brain injury and can't think straight anymore, okay? It doesn't matter if you have these intense pains in your neck and back and you need neck and back surgery, okay? It doesn't matter how bad the car looks. Once you've taken that money from the insurance company, okay, that's it. It's done, all right? So it's really very, very important to talk to an attorney first. I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've had that conversation. And it's just a difficult conversation to have because I really want to help that person. That person really needs the help. But something has been done that we can't undo. Okay, and once that release is signed, once that money and that check is deposited, man, it's it's almost impossible. Okay, now we, we did see during COVID that there was a little bit where the insurance companies would direct deposit the money and we had some ability to undo those uh, because they, it wasn't a check. There wasn't that actual action by the potential client. Okay, but it, it's, it's a sad, sad story. So um, it, it just really is because what I see on a day-to-day -day basis is even with hiring an attorney, even with paying the attorney fees, even with going to the doctor and paying all those doctor bills, clients are walking away with much, much more than $500. Now, look, are there times that they only walk away? Yes, with $500, sure. But those are very unique scenarios, and every case is different, okay? But the more hurt you are, the bigger the crash is, the more hurt you are, the bigger the value of your case is, the more that you're going to walk away with. Okay, as a general rule, but here's the reality. Some of that money is meant for your future medical bills, right? So all of that gets calculated and put into play. So not only are we looking at what your current medical bills are, right? The current treat, medical treatment that you've had. So if you've had surgery, we look at that and, and all the other pieces, everything in between. So we, maybe you didn't have surgery, right? Maybe you were just really banged up and you had some MRIs done and the MRIs don't show anything, but you still have a bill. You still have a few thousand dollar bill that somebody else should pay other than you, right? So we take all that into consideration. We take your pain and suffering into consideration, all right? Which there's no bright line that tells us how much pain and suffering is. It's really essentially a guess because you could take the same facts to five different juries and you're going to get five different opinions on what, how much pain and suffering for that particular case, okay? And your, your future medical bills, um, and then also any of your lost wages. So that's what we look at, and that's how we piece it together. So I, I do, I just find it really disheartening when I talk to somebody who says the insurance company offered me $500 and I took it because that insurance company is preying on you. They're absolutely preying on you to get you to take the lowest amount of money possible because it helps their bottom line. At the end of the day, don't help their bottom line. Okay. You need to worry about your bottom line. And that is what any good personal injury attorney is here for is to help your bottom line and to get you feeling better. That is the show for today. It's the law father podcast. Check us out on all of us, all of our social media search for at the law father. Okay. It's different ways in, in some of the different areas. Well, mostly because we can't get some people to, to give it up, even though they probably should, and we own the trademark. But anyway, that's a whole other story for a whole other day. And uh, try to take a look at the DJ Eakin podcast. Even if I don't make it on it this week, um, for un any unforeseen circumstances, check it out. Check out all the shows on Radio Influence. It's the Law Father right here from Law Father headquarters. Law Father out.